Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about nonlinearity in FEA. So nonlinear FEA can manifest itself in several forms. We could have material nonlinearity such as plasticity or hyperelasticity, geometry nonlinearity where the deformation is large, boundary condition nonlinearity for cases that the boundary condition is changing such as contact problem or fall or force. We're just going to introduce this type of nonlinearity and we are not going to go into details of modeling each case. It's very important to identify what type of nonlinearity we have. Uh, perhaps nonlinear FEA is the most common misunderstood uh, uh, topic. People use the term nonlinear without mentioning what type they are talking about. And you will see that each case would be vastly different. The most common type is material nonlinearity. So when people are not saying what type they are using, uh, probably they are referring to material nonlinearity. And it's defined where the stress is not linearly proportional to a strain. This nonlinear behavior could be in the elastic region or the plastic region. We are going to start with the plastic region and call it plasticity. So if we have a stress strain curve, then we have elastic region, and then beyond yield, we have the plastic region. So it's a schematic uh, stress strain curve here. We have perfect plasticity, and then we have the strain hardening, and then the necking region. And if you are dealing with the true stresses and true strains, so you would go to point E prime. So E prime would be for the case of true stresses. So if our material is brittle, such as ceramic, then the plasticity does not exist. Or it's better to say that uh, we can neglect the plasticity for ceramic and we can use a standard FEA. But if you're using a ductile material and if you are interested in material behavior beyond the yield, then we have to model our material, model the plasticity portion of our material whether we are dealing with finding permanent deformation or finding a fracture, uh, then we need to see how our material is performing. In the elastic region, we only need elastic modulus. So the slope of a stress strain curve will give us elastic modulus and that would be enough to model our material in a standard FEA. But if we are modeling plasticity, we have to use more than one elastic modulus or more than one modulus and we call these modulus tangent modulus and we have multiple moduli or instead of having this multilinear uh, approximation we could plug in the value of a stress and a strain curve basically importing our stress and strain curve into our model and saying that for each a specific strain case we have stress so plugging the value of stresses and strains or use plasticity models here I'm listing the plasticity models that you would find in ANSYS workbench so there are different models the common ones are isotropic and kinematic hardening we could have bilinear or multilinear and depending on material, one model works uh, better than the other. And these models are based on experimental parameters. So some of them you have to use two parameters up to five or ten parameters. Uh, so you could use the models. And these parameters can be determined uh, experimentally. The other form of material nonlinearity is nonlinear elasticity. So here we are talking about nonlinearity in the elastic region. Several materials such as polymers, rub, and specifically forms, they show nonlinear elasticity. And hyperelasticity is a model that we use for nonlinear elasticity. And we can use it when our material is isotropic, incompressible, and is independent of uh, strain rate. Then we can use hyperelasticity model. For nonlinear elasticity, uh, our options are similar. Either we can use the experimental curve and plugging the stress and strain curve, saying that at this point we have a corresponding strains and stresses, and you're plugging the value into your model, whether you're using a software or you're writing your own 
court or use the common models available for hyperelastic materials. And here is the image of ANSYS APDL. You can see that it also tells you that for foam, these models would work better. And they have parameters that you need to determine experimentally so you could use such models. ANSYS has purchased CES software, so now you can link material with your, uh, with your model. So you could import the stress strain curve directly within ANSYS uh, to predict your uh, model beyond yield point. The other form of nonlinearity is geometry. So this type of nonlinearity would be present when the geometry changes significantly. So here in this image that I'm showing you, you can think of it like a trampoline. Then after deformation, that's the form you would get. And then further deformation, you can see the geometry is significantly changing. And when the geometry is changing, the stiffness matrix is changing. So we cannot use the same stiffness matrix throughout the solution. So we have to update our stiffness matrix because our geometry is updated. Because this, if we have a mesh here, then now the mesh is stretched so far that the aspect ratio is, is very high. And if we do not update our stiffness matrix or our mesh, we would get an incorrect uh, result. Here in this graph, I'm showing you the geometry nonlinearity means large deformation and the material nonlinearity. They are not uh, correlated. You could have both, you could have none, you could have one and not the other. So they are completely independent what type of nonlinearity we might have in, in our problem. The other form of geometry nonlinearity is again when the deformation is large, but here is more mathematical. When the deformation is large, the strain is large, then we cannot neglect several components that we commonly neglect for finite strength. So this is the equation that we use for shear strength, but in case of large deformation, there are components that we can no longer neglect. So we have three more components. For the linear case, we have the first two components, and if we have large deformation, then other components would be present as well. So if you're writing your own code, you have to include such components when you're finding the strength. If you're using software, usually they give you the option to turn on the large deformation. So turning on this large deformation would enforce the software to carry the nonlinear term. So it makes your computation a little bit more expensive, but more accurate. So in case of infinitesimal strain, means when the strain is very small, we can develop our equation. So think of an undeformed shape as this square, and then with the dimension in one and two direction with dx1, the differential x and differential x2, and after deformation, it takes such a form, then we have the displacement in direction one, the displacement in the second direction, and if you find the angle theta one and theta two, you can see that tangent theta would be deformation of in direction two over the original displacement or original length. And if you're having a small angle approximation, tangent theta is equal to theta. Similarly for theta two. So the engineering shear strain, which is the addition of the two angle change would be the addition of the two components. And if you want to write the tensor shear strain is just half of our engineering shear strain. And we get this equation that we are familiar with for the case of infinitesimal strain, when the strain is, is small. But when the strain is not small, when we have finite strain or large deformation, then we cannot use that small angle approximation. And then a nonlinear term would appear into our equation and, and we cannot neglect it because the deformation is large. Here I'm showing you the equation in form of index notation. We talked about that index notation is used to simplify equations. Here I and J are the free indices 
So free indices were defined as the indices that are not repeated within a component and a, uh, within a term. And a term was defined as components that are separated by plus or equal sign. So here in this on the left side of the equation, i and j are the free indices. Free indices expand equations. So if you're talking about 3D, i and j are changing from 1 to 3. We have two free indices. So 3 to the power of 2 would be 9. So we have this one equation in form of index notation will give us 9 equations. So, and then here, let's see if we have any dummy indices. K would be the dummy index because it's repeated. And dummy indices indicate summation. So if I want to write an example, let's say I equals 1, J equals 2, so epsilon 1, 2, we replace I and J here. And then here, because K, the dummy index, is repeated. So we have u1, u1, x1, x2, and then go to 2 and go to 3 for a three-dimensional case. So we get our three additional component that were not present when we had small deformation. The other type of nonlinearity is when the boundary condition is changing or contact problem. So here in this image, you can see we don't have any contact. So the boundary condition is different when we apply the load and then this one is touching here. Then we have a boundary condition. Or in this image, when as the load is being applied, the deformation changes and the boundary condition changes. More parts would be in contact. And perhaps the most common type of contact problem that you have seen so far would be when two gears are in contact. If you remember in machine design, we developed uh, bending stresses and contact stresses. And if you remember, contact stresses were nonlinear. The relationship between the force and displacement uh, were nonlinear. So here is the same thing. The, we have contact, and then the boundary condition is changing. At the, at the point of contact, stresses are higher. And as we go away from the contact area, stresses are getting lower and lower. So we have a region that we have large stresses and we have that contact stresses. Perhaps the most common type of contact theory is the Hertz contact theory. Hertz is developed for two spherical objects in contact, but that can be expanded to any geometry. So Hertz theory is saying that if our the formation radius, if A, is small compared to the radius of our object. If our object is flat, the radius is infinity. So here, if it's spherical, then we have a radius. Then we could find a relation between force and this deformation. And also, according to geometry, we could relay this radius to the depth of deformation. That's usually more helpful when we are relating force and, and displacement. Then if you're plugging the value and simplify it, you can find a relation before force and the displacement. You can see it's displacements to the power of 3 over 2. So we have a nonlinear relation between force and displacement. And that's the nature of contact problem. Here, ER is the reduced modulus, which is function of the modulus of the first body in contact and the modulus of the second body in contact and new one and new two are the Python ratio. And the last type of nonlinearity is follower force, when the load is changing with deformation. Here in this case is a non-follower force. So you can see the magnitude of the force and the direction of force is not changing. The example could be the pressure of a fluid on an object. The pressure is always perpendicular to the surface, regardless of the deformation. And here we have a follower force, where it's towards the member. As the member is changing, the force is also changing. And the example could be mechanisms that you have multiple members, and the force on each member is exerted by the other member. It could be two force members, so the member would be their intention or compression. And as the, mem as the mechanism is uh, moving, then the force is changing direction as well. So a follower force would be another example of
nonlinearity. So if you want to summarize nonlinearity in FEA, then if elastic modulus is a function of the deformation, whether in elastic region or plastic region, then we have material nonlinearity. If the B matrix or the strain coefficient matrix, or we can think of it as a, if the strains are a function of the displacement, then we have geometry nonlinearity. If our force is a function of displacement, then we have the follower force nonlinearity. And if the boundary condition is changing with the deformation, then we have contact nonlinearity. So in FEA, in a standard FEA, we wrote F equals KU. So the nonlinearity could, could present itself in, in force, in a stiffness, in deformation, and the relation between a strain and displacement.